one of the absolute beauties of doing something live is I'm not even joking. 30 seconds ago, the doorbell rang and Robert Collins had to run and get it really quick <laughs> right now, live real time front door stuff. This has happened to me about four times in webinars, like where people have paid and showed up. So it's pretty nutty. You gotta love when you put something on Craigslist out there and someone just goes, Oh, I think now's a good time to drop on by. Oh my gosh. I can't even begin to fathom that. You know what? Let's start with the easy stuff, Bob. Tell me a little bit about where you're working right now, where you are in the world right now. We're going to talk so much nerdery today that it is not going to, everyone's going to leave at some point, but I want to know where you are right now because Scott asked me a great question yesterday, which was how come you don't talk so much about origin stories and what a perfect time to roll out origin stories than with my fellow super nerd, Bob Collins. Bob, where are you now though? Give us the in media res of it. Um, I don't quite have the longitude and latitude, but uh, from that particular standpoint, but fundamentally I am after years of doing agency work, doing B2B tech enterprise, everything from, you know, software, security, middleware, you know, and then moving into from pure communications, moving over to digital, social, community management, helping agencies grow from across the spectrum. A lot of them have amazing collective respect for, but as you moved up in your career, you stopped being a creative. As you moved up in a career, you had the P&L, which was fantastic because then I had a lot of amazing opportunity to mentor, foster, be amazed by the work of other people and watch them take into new steps and do things and then help train that group of people. But the operational element always became, I got more and more distant from the clients, from the executives, from the entrepreneurs who have vision and passion so I've actually started doing my own thing, working with um, uh, Series B, Series C companies who are looking to take their vision and expand it over and actually become larger scale, you know, um, SaaS tech companies that realize that communications and how you tell your story is obviously as important as what you do. Oh, and we lost your signal there, Chris. <laughs> I, you know, courtesy is that I mute myself and then idiocy is that I can't see the glowing green button or red that tells me that it's on or not. So let's go the in there. Time. Let's go back. Um, so series B means that they've already made some of their early mistakes. They have an operating budget. They kind of know where the money is or isn't so that you don't have to fight them over like they can or can't afford you. They either can or can't, but they know they can or can't. You, um, so your grown up person day job is helping companies kind of make that next big hump up and over from we've got some systems, but not all the systems. We've got some ways we're talking about ourselves, but not all those ways. Is that fair enough way to talk about it? Yeah, it, it's like, you know, um, it's, it's like they have, they're, they're focused on their product and their industry, but they're not focused on the issues that their product or the industry are evolving into. So how do you create a thought leadership element? by pulling that out, putting that narrative in there, that umbrella positioning, and then they can kind of go, oh, how are we supporting our current customers? How are we talking about what's happening and changing in the industry? How can we have a voice that's not talking about us, but we can actually create a new market category, create something that actually matters and actually have that voice, not just, there was a big thing that happened you know, 10 years ago where everyone just talked about content, but no one was talking about engagement and no one was talking about and I don't like the word influencers, but no one was talking to the people who actually already have an authority voice in there. So I'm making those connections with those people. So I usually say the joke is stop. You got to get your message off the seventh floor. You just have to stop making stuff up and you have to start leading. So you are going into companies now, uh, as opposed to having been part of several different teams over the, over time, it must've always been tricky uh, to fit your very specific puzzle piece into a team. Like I, I can't fathom that there was ever kind of an out of the box fit for the model that is Robert Collins. No, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Cause I tend, tend to do like, I think you put this adage out there many, many moons ago um, before there was inbound when there was even new mark, uh, you know, the new marketing summit, there's a reason why, you know, God gave you two years in one month. You listen for a long period of time you take your expertise 
And I do kind of like that Peter Falk thing in Columbo. And I wait for that throwaway comment, that throwaway issue, that throwaway thing that actually is their true identity as, an, as a company, as a nerve, as their leadership team, as their founding goal. And I go, that's your crystal. Everything else can your foundation. Everything else can spur around from that. But you can't say it in the first three seconds. You have to like drill down until they do that throwaway. You know, Columbo, how did you just cue me up for Columbo? So there's this dumb joke I heard a million years ago mm-hmm. about Peter Falk, who plays Columbo, uh, going down to Cape Cod, and he gets a little lost. And I can't do an impression of Peter Falk, but I'm going to pretend anyway. And so he's walking around somewhere in Cape Cod. He comes up to him. He says, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, but, but, but could you tell me where I am? <laughs> they say, you're an athol, Mr. Falk. And the joke is that he's Falk and athol. So he's Falk and athol. That, that's, that's right up there with the bad joke of uh, the guy who gets lost in the plane, who's driving in, in the fog. And he's – Give it. And okay, he got, he's in a little nice little convenient. He's in a biplane, but he sees the tip of a building and he goes over to the tip of the building. And he starts circling until some people come out and he goes, Where am I? And they go, You're in a plane. <laughs> he goes, So he goes, Ah, I know exactly where I am. I must be near Seattle because that only answer is only going to come from people who work at Microsoft because it's absolutely accurate, but of no value whatsoever. Oh my gosh. That was the back that was that was the story probably back in the in the 90s. Oh my gosh. Oh, and and a throwback Microsoft joke which is a perfect 90 degree segue to the fact that you are such a tip of the iceberg kind of guy when it comes to your nerdness. Um I have never come across a much more handsome rendition of comic book guy in my life. Uh, and it, it all starts from kind of being lost in the sauce a little bit in a, in a very busy household. Let's start back. This is for Scott who said, you know, I got to do more origin stories. Who is Robert Collins in the early days, the very childy days? Uh, I'm trying to figure out not to do my Wayne's world going or throw back the chain. Uh, but it really, a couple things. I would say one of the first early memories I've ever had was because my father knew the power of actually connecting something with something you're trying to teach somebody, creating something visually and something tactfully and something sensory to going to happen. He gave me, I was three and a half, almost four years old, and I still have this memory because he also took pictures of it and those are up there. So it kept it like that branch kept on being a touchstone. July, 1969, early morning, dad pulls you in from outside playing on the street, gives you the large Betty Crocker mixing bowl full of a a, a gallon and a half of chocolate ice cream and said, the lunar moon landing is happening. We're going to watch it live. And I, you know, growing up with a family of five brothers and, you know, five, five brothers and sisters, you know, full family, small cape. Two bedroom, you know, three bedrooms, one one bath. You know, you were fighting for like when you got dessert at the end of the day, you got that small bowl. I had the gallon and a half chocolate ice cream, and I'm eating the entire thing and thinking this is like the most amazing experience I've ever had. But it was that wired together, fired together moment that actually kept that memory intact, and that I would, from that particular moment on, I had. A, pure infatuation for the space program, NASA, anything science fiction across the board. And that was like that grounding thing. I need to know about stories, how they're told, how they're presented. Um, And that just like brought it out for me throughout the rest of the ages. So my comic books and nerdy story uh, origin story is not the same, but has some interesting similarities. My, um, I, my grampy was a candy salesman. He was the best candy salesman in Augusta, Maine. He won awards for it, got Florida trips for it, that sort of thing. Million dollars sold in candy. Uh, has the plaque, had the plaque. Um, and I would go around on his candy route back when there were lots of places to get candy. And um, I would go to Depot News downtown Augusta, which is yep. the Greyhound Bus Depot. I would go to Flo's Variety up on Sand Hill where I never saw my grandfather sell a single thing. I just saw him hug people and tell stories. But I would get along the way 
you know, the early Michael Morbius stuff with Spider-Man, I would get, uh, which no kid should have had at that age. I was like five. Um, I started learning to read on things like um, uh, Justice Society of America and how cool that there were generations of it. And, and then as I got a little older, they taught me, see, and as I got a little older, they taught me, you know, about the roots before that, Edgar Rice Burroughs and, 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 um, John Carter of Mars, as well as Tarzan and, and all that sort of stuff. And Asimov, what was your, what do you remember being kind of your first locked in fandom? What was the first big fandom for Robert Collins? Um, it was, it took place right after first grade. There was a little story, um, uh, in, I grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts, and there is something called Patriots Day that happens here. People come from across the nation, you know, to the um, to the Lexington Green, do the reenactment of the Battle Green of the Redcoats and the Minutemen, the first shot high in the world, birthplace of America type thing. That particular day, we had, you know, there was a morning, there was a morning parade, a big afternoon, you know, gala. It was pancake breakfast. Then you went over to some friend's house. We got in a car late afternoon after the afternoon parade, and we're all driving home. On the way home, big old Pontiac Bonneville. My mother goes, we have no brakes. I'm not sure which what's going to go. This is back in the day. There weren't seat belts in those back of those big old bucket seats. She took, she says, I can go down this road and go into a main thoroughfare, or I can take this back road and try to wind the car down on some back roads. She took the turn, went down the hill, came right into a tree, crashed in the tree. Everyone pretty much pretty messed up. I can go into the gory details, what happened, but that's not this, that's not this story. <laughs> um, everyone survived. Everyone was okay. I mean, it was so Okay, there was some, you know, ribs broken, jaws broken, things of that nature, arms broken. I went through the back window, 85 stitches across my skull. Um, remember the cold of being in the ambulance and that shiver as you got home. But I was released within two days. But some of my other family were in the, the hospital. While I was alone in the house, comic books came. Something to read. Because I couldn't, I was strained by bright lights and the TV for the, the head injury. So I was just in a darkened room with comic books, which seems like the perfect place. And I was given the origin of Marvel comic characters by Stan Lee, that classic iconic element that talked about the origin of Thor, the origin of the Fantastic Four, the origin of the X-Men across the board, if you will, and all these amazing stories. And I was like, this is my new Bible. These were the stories that were gonna, you know, that, that and pull me in, help me through, and always connected with those origin stories and what they took on from there. And from that particular point, I think it was until the, my latter and junior high, I was a comic book freak. I was down at the spinner rack at the local convenience store. 75 cents in my pocket, you know, get a hostess Twinkie or a hostess cupcake, bad Coke, and whatever is on the rack. And from this day, I have a collection from those that are now iconically classic. All right, ten million directions. This is super choose your own adventure, but I've got to I've got to connect up with one detail, which is that um, I was a comic book guy since age five. But in fifth grade, I broke my collarbone uh, in a sledding mishap, and my mom's coworker T.K. Williams would bring by big fistfuls of comics for me to read with the busted collarbone. Collarbone, by the way, is one of the dumbest bones to break. Like, there's not a lot. You basically the way you have to treat it is you put like what looks like a bra on. There's nothing a fifth grade boy wants more than to wear a bra. And so, you know, it's a, well, not one of those, just the, um, Oh, this the shoulder straps. Oh yeah. You know, if they'd, if it, if they'd equipped it with an empty gun holster, it would have looked really cool. Like one of those under the armpit guns. Oh things. yeah. It could have been the Nick Fury thing, but quite not. Yeah. Exactly. See you. Look, no one else is going to know, but yes, absolutely. Agents of shield 1970s edition back when Nick was a different race. Uh, but yeah, Jim Sarenko. So Jim Steranko's, yes. Oh my gosh, this never ends. So Wait, let's let's make this the same way. Who's influenced by Andy Warhol, the '60s movement? We're talking yes. Dolly. This all came into art and comics. It's amazing. 
And and that time, okay, I'll go there for a, two more sentences, and then I got to bring everybody in because they're going to fall asleep on us. The uh, that time there was a big movement going around inside comic books that it was the closest to psychedelic drugs you could get without taking the psychedelic drugs. Doctor Strange was in that same mode. There were yep. all these kinds of people that like you know kind of fit this like crazy art that was like. Um, diversive and all that and, and very you know subversive and there was all this stuff going on um but when i want to go from that bob and i have two questions that kind of dovetail one is why was this our refuge and then two is you get only one wish one character that you could be uh <laughs> with no weird twist arounds who would be the character well, it, it's interesting. It definitely feels like a very carry question here, but that's quite all right. And I'll take I'll take I'll take that particular in a moment. The why question is something that probably permeates throughout my career today, because it was a combination of storytelling, and the combination of the you know back in the earlier days with you know, wired you know the fire together gets wired together. It's always with art, vis and visual design, and storytelling, mm -hmm. and I find myself as like. Um, I'm, my craft is writing. My heart is design and art. So when I can, can try, and today we have the medium and opportunity to kind of bring those things together. My, my son lives in the world of memes and visual arts and so on and so forth as, as storytelling. This goes back as the, the cave days back in France when they found those initial drawings. These, all these iconic things. And then what happened in the, you know, the seventies when we found those, is that they took them from comic strips and they turned into comic books where they took an entire canvas when they had an opportunity to create that art to tell that story in a unique way. And that's always stayed with me. And I think it was that we're exploring with the X-Men, we're exploring you know, an injustice across the road. Um, but the Hulk, we're exploring, you know, uh, we wanna be, uh, we're, the, we're going against the system as that's, that's happening at that particular time. So, um, and the run with, uh, um, uh, Neil Adams and, you know, Denny O'Neill, who unfortunately just passed away last week, who actually kind of, right. created, you know, like uh, the whole dichotomy of Green Lantern and Green Arrow actually talking about social injustice issues from the right and the left conservative and progressive elements. These are all happening during this time. And they're a voice. And that's why I always turn back to comics to be and Batman to be kind of the voice of where we are today, because what the, the voice we need. So you were raised on Marvel, but have a soft spot for Batman. Something else we have in common. Um, let's do. Let's play a little bit of One's Gotta Go. This is a recommendation by V. Kerry or O'Shea Gorgon. Um, you've got. Let's see. Let me let me pick an X Men. It can't. Be, well, first off, oh. can't be Cyclops. Oh, there's only there. weirdos like Cyclops. Oh no, I mean, I, I mean, Silex says, you know, he's got his own little visor thing. He's only got his own little backstory. A, a great leader. But to your other question, who would I want to be? Yeah. The only one. You only get the one. The only one. If I had the mental strength, it would be Xavier. Get out. Nobody picks him. That's a that's a really interesting choice because of the, because of that power, that ability to kind of work work in and out of people's brains. Or I, I think it's the power be be able because when you move through, I can do this. It goes back to my other element of listening to know what is the common ground for people to connect to try to do something better. I mean, we might live in a world where a lot of social media and content things and, and, thing, and narratives can, you know, can, uh, uh, fear can control people. But I do feel like there's always the light that can give people that actually fuel and drive people. And I think that's one thing I always liked about Xavier. He said, we can go down one path with this power or we can try to go down another path. So that's my answer there. That is some answer. You know, I, I always... Like if you said Wolverine, I would have written you off, and you couldn't possibly have been Wolverine anyway. It just it just isn't the right thing. Um, if you had said I would have, I could have seen you doing somebody like um, somebody a little more supporty or something like you know uh, Bobby Drake, or I could I could see you picking a lot of other characters. Um, but Xavier is like it's a pretty choice role, but also just not the not the one. Now I want to give people a little sense of you know why Marvel DC. By the way, DC's problem with every one of their characters is that they're almost always like otherworldly and godlike, and yeah. you know you can never really be them, but you can just appreciate the crazy stories. Marvel's characters were all based on psychological challenges. They were all based on things that people might feel. Uh, Stan Lee 
wrote a lot of this. Stanley Leibowitz wrote a lot of this with the concept of, you know, uh, a lot of uh, Jews were having problems in the world. He, he came from right around the World War II times into this world. He was still being persecuted. So the X-Men is a story of persecution and what it's like to be a weirdo and not really accepted by society. Every episode or issue of the X-Men was like, well, you saved the world again, but you're a big asshole and we hate you. You're, you're, um, you're, you're a deviant. Be done with you. Yeah, you're bad. Um, Hulk is, you know, basically every child's power problem. Like, who wouldn't want to be the Hulk? You've got a bully at school. Your your parent hits you or something like that. The Hulk is that story of if you had the power and could, like, let your anger go for a minute, what would you do with it? And then what was the Hulk is that that is how do you – he always wants to know, I know I have this inner rage. I want to, I want to learn how to better understand it. So it's always that element too. Well, right, right, because – you know, if if it was just him, what makes Hulk a real character and not like you know, so, not something that only kids want, is that um, he was forever battling his rage and battling with you know trying to understand how to make himself a whole person. Hulk is like the only one of these guys who might actually go to a therapist. Um, it's really interesting when you review this stuff as a as a grown up. You and I also know that there's been some ages of comics, so to speak. And there's when we first got into it, there was a, a lot of energy going on for a lot of reasons. And then things got weird in the 90s. And the reason this applies to business, the reason this is interesting uh, ab about this is that these ages kind of also influence your business decisions, my business decisions, how we put a lens on the world also has comics behind it, even though we don't explain that ever in a meeting if we can help it. No, I mean, exactly. The comics have always been, like any good art form, have been an expression of their time, um, an expression and design of their time and reflection. So how we can learn from it to better improve the world around us. Um, and that was definitely the set of the 70s throughout the Vietnam War, throughout racial right. injustice, throughout the the, the 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 introduction of heroin that became a little bit more mainstream throughout the um, throughout the cities and, and things of that nature. Um, in the 80s, we had, you know, Alan Moore's The Watchman, who was basically talking about um, power um, and what that power was going to be doing if it was trying to unify the world, but as having too much power across the board. We had HBO, uh, Daniel Lindelof, when he actually recreated the new Watchmen, which was focusing upon what do we do with, you know, that seat of power when it's actually, I mean, we filtered it through what's happening with endemic racism today. And you could not think of a more, like, as you were talking about things that happen day in, day out that amazes you. And I can't believe this is happening and the next hit keeps on coming that, you know, we're now having a convention just outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the biggest, you know, amazing uprising happened in, you know, the beginning of the century um, against, you know, upcoming and growing, you know, black population that was being financially prosperous. Right. So, it's always kind of like we're doing that social commentary and where we're learning from it. And it's always going to be that particular cycle. And that's, that, that's a thing that um, I always credit science fiction and, and comics and all that with uh, Star Trek and all that Star Trek was dealing with race relations stories in the sixties. Oh, yeah. It was a huge to do. Martin Luther King told Michelle Nichols, you know, stay on screen weirdo. We need Uhuru because you are changing the world. Yeah. She was thinking about wanting to leave and he goes, no, you're on that bridge. You're the representation of where we're going to be in the future. Robert Collins said on Punch Out, you've got to find an outlet, a passionate interest that can rejuvenate you. It's great when it can be a shared experience because then it's communal. So there's that part of comics as well. Comics allows a whole bunch of socially anxious people to get together. It allows us to instantly have a secret handshake that we don't have in any other way. And when football guys would come around and say, you don't understand what it's like, you know, because they can spout their stats and we can spout our stats. We can talk about adamantium versus vibranium. They could talk about who did, uh, you know, however many sports ball kick goals or whatever no, they call them. I, I, could, I could talk about, you know, the first appearance of Batman was in May 1939 with, uh, you know, Bob Kane and Bill Finger, who Bill actually Finger. created the key elements that actually make uh, Batman iconic. You know, Captain America was in March 1941. You know, Joe Simon, is that a racist comic early on? Oh, Jack yeah, Kirby. Uh, Superman, 19, June 1938. Wonder Woman, 1941. 
And our dear friend, Mr. Spider-Man himself, Mr. Peter Parker, when I got re-injured back again, was, you know, Amazing Fantasy back in 1962, I believe. Um, you know, but it also goes on today. All those stats and things where people like throw out their stats of this ball player, that ball player. I mean, do you know that, you know, Deadpool was introduced in the, you know, the issue number 98 of New Mutants? Rob Leefield has to be blamed for that. Is it Liefield or Leefield? I've never known. Um, do you know? I, I, I don't, and that's okay. That's fine. I always call him Lee Field. I, I always call him the guy I, who I, can't I, draw I, feet. I, felt, I have no idea why, because every time he does his podcast, I can never understand what he talks about. Who knew? <laughs> John just said sports ball kicks my coffees all over my screen. But that's what it sounds like, John. When I, you know, I, Robert and I, I keep trying to call you Bob, but, you know, I'm, I'm honoring you. Robert and I um, did play sports ball with the other boys. It's just, you know, we did it to fit in. It was like being gay. I mean, being a comic fan was a lot like being gay when you were a kid. Being a nerd was like that. Like, it was not cool. And then one day, every, every, you know, the geeks did inherit the earth. And all of a sudden, my kids all wear Deadpool shirts to school. And it's, it's a strange time. I want to talk about that because you and I and everybody kind of vanished from comics for some duration as we must put away childish things and blah, blah, blah. That's all My meant. return was that Secret Wars run that came out, the, the recent one with the scrolls and everything. And that was, I don't even remember when any now. It's like early, mid 2000s or something. And that was the real run that made me go, oh my gosh, I forgot why I liked the storytelling aspects of books. What was, what was your... When did you vanish from this, and when did you come back? Um, uh, I I hate to use the word right you know you know red blooded American back in the day, but it was like, you know, there's only so many times I could take the bus over to uh, Minuteman Tech Institute and learn assembly and program and Fortran and basic language, so I could write my own uh, code on my TRS eighty. Um, and then right. you know, books, and then it was like ninth or tenth grade when I woke up and just kind of said, "Oh, there's interesting people around me," <laughs> and they don't Girls. all and they don't all roll dice and you know are, are, are paladins, if you will. So from that particular point, but it was a combination while I was in college that this one that this one came out, which was the actually very first introduction, the Secret Wars the run by Jim. Original Secret Wars, first original, black costume. Yes, where the, the actually the very first uh, appearance of Spider-Man's black costume, which- AKA one, that one, uh, quasi the first appearance of Venom. Exactly, because that was actually the ball, of the intelligence and the alien that came down when he had his suka element back and forth. Um, then later on, it actually became uh, a good friend of mine who I grew up, who Michelle Delfino, who moved away to Minneapolis, and she was involved in Ryko Disc. And she just, everyone was just pummeling her with like amazing tapes of, she worked with David Bowie and Elvis Costello. And there was a whole comics and thing out there. And she introduced me to Kurt Busiek in Astro City and his run where he looked at, oh, let, me, yeah. let me take a look at comic book characters, not from like, we're mighty, but from the view of the world around them and how they're dealing with that. Um, almost like Alex Ross did with Marvels back in the day. And that kind of brought me back into that whole era that then got me going, oh, I have to go back now and kind of re-engage in this because I was out of college, you know, uh, still single, doing my thing. But it was always the storytelling that was absolutely amazing. And it was like, it was Alex, it was Kurt Busiek's Astro City run that said, I got to go back into this. And But when I was in college, it was Alan Moore's, the Watchmen in each issue, which I originally have. And I actually have one issue signed by Mr. Moore himself. I've got to go to this because you and I have a vividly different spin on this. I keep nothing. Anything in my house is not more than a couple years old. <laughs> really isn't. And not like that. Everything's new and shiny way. Just like, fuck it. I don't need it. Don't need it. Don't need it. I have one small box of some of my clippings of stuff like, you know, success magazine and that really only for like my parents and my kids eventually that's it other than that i have no mementos you keep everything you are a collector talk about that well it's interesting um i was redoing my house about a year and a half ago and i uh and i was i purchased my family's house so in the basement which is by many people back there was just known as the bunker would you have to sign a little waiver before you go downstairs because you might not come back because you don't know what's going to be down there. But everything is down there. But two years ago, I got rid of 
two and a half, two, ton, two, two and a half ton dumpsters worth of stuff. And I've only kept the most iconic things that kind of melt the moan to me. And it goes back to the, the origin element of being seven people in a small house. How do you have that touchstone of your own self? These became like my touchstones. These became like, I, I understand that. I recognize that it brings me back to that place. It matters to me. I can let things go a lot more readily now, but for like, for, but for every 10 things I have, I only have one. There can be only one. I know. Oh. We're no, we're, we're no Highlander reference here, but I mean like, but the other, but I still do collectors. Like there was like this amazing iconic Ditko cover for Spider-Man. So I'm like going, I might, I want to get it for the art, but I do want to share. Uh, oh, and then there was the other, uh, the other week, there was the 80th anniversary of Detective Comics. Oh, wow. So this, you know, once again, this came back in 19, out in 1985 or like um, 1939. And this is the Alex Ross recreation of the actually original element here. But this, you know, I don't have the original Batman, but what I do have, and I'll share this with you, and this is the last of the collection sharing. And I might've give you a little preview the other day. This is one of the iconic comic book covers of all the 1970s. And maybe some people say of all collective time, but capturing it, this is the, the Muhammad, uh, Muhammad Ali versus Superman fight by uh, written, you know, by Neil Adams and and Denny Connor. But like and on the cover, they created my son would kill me right now because I don't let him touch us without gloves. Without gloves. I'm staying, I'm holding my breath. You know, like but he has like all these amazing icons from the 70s across. And, and just here in the front, uh, you know, they have, you know, Batman. Uh, they have uh, Jimmy Carter. And over here actually was is Telly Savalas, but they couldn't get the right. <gasps> Who Telly loves Savalas. you, baby? Oh, loves you, baby. But wow. they couldn't get the rights to Telly Savala, so they were like, you know what they did? They just removed his lollipop from his hand. But in but in the rest of us, there's, you know, there's Lucio Ball. There's actually, you know, um, and then some artists they couldn't get, like down here, there's actually John Wayne, but they, he couldn't get the rights for John Wayne, so he just put a mustache on him. And he's right next to uh, John, uh, Johnny Carson. Anyways. Oh, my gosh. Karnak himself. Um, listen, so I have a question about this. There is a thing about nerds and super nerds and comic nerds that we love. Like when you and I talk, I have never once floated a reference by you that you didn't know, or you must be the fastest Googler on earth. Why is that our badge of pride? Why is that? You're a museum, Bob. You're a museum waiting for guests to come in with a ticket. Why? Um, I, and it's interesting because if you like sat, if I had a piece of paper and someone said, write the top things you like about the X-Men down, I don't know if I could do it. Um, be, you know, because it was just like, it wouldn't come right off the cash, but having these conversations or that reference out there or when, or like in that bad episode of MASH, when he smells something tactile, it like brings back this flashback memory every time. Um, and the conversations that you've been having with catch up people, I'm chiming in there because and this is, I jokingly say, you know, it's a curse, not a gift, because all they're doing is just rewiring what's currently there and just bringing it forth, bringing it forth. And it's, um, and it just goes back to the early conversation of what gets wired, to, you know, fired together, gets wired together. And there's just something out there that's just going to bring it back up. But we love doing it um, with other people who respect it. Because what you can do is you get that little bit of, it's always about recognition and, and community. And they get the... You get me, noob, noob. You get me. <laughs> exactly. So, oh my gosh, there is, you know, to me, I think, I think that's my answer to that question. You know, sort of, why do I do this? Um, there's a line in the song "Christian Sands" by Tricky where he says, uh, "It means we'll manage. I'll master your language, and in the meantime, I'll create my own." And the idea of sort of shared language. The idea that like, even when we wrote trust agents, Julian Smith and I stuck in some parts, like we talked about rolling for saving throws. And, you know, when people read that in trust agents in 2009, they were like, Oh my God, I did saving throws. you know, because that's that feeling we have. And I think, you know, humankind's greatest need, according to Stephen Covey is the need to feel wanted. Yep. And I think that there were so many of us who, who just didn't have any other connecting tissues, you know, to other ways that we wanted to connect. And, and we just didn't have this vast field of dreams to play in uh, without this set of tools. 
And I think those two things together made the secret layer, don't you think? Oh, yeah. But it also reminds me of a quote from uh, one of my favorite authors, Jonathan Lethem, who is uh, actually, uh, no, uh, it was Jonathan Carroll in White Apples, when he just says, the secret of life in people actually is not just to be, you know, uh, to, uh, is to be understood and not just re not just respected, to be understood, like the layer down in that area. So sometimes it's that touch on a connection and something that they just kind of go, ah, we had no idea you were on the other part of the globe. I was doing this, I was doing this, but this moment that we don't even know still connects us. And, you know, and it, it is finding that gestalt of, of humanity as you do that, you can do almost anything together if you can find those sparks together. So I don't know if Scott Woodard is still here, but you know we talked about your origin story and and how that relates to your your current role. Do you find yourself using this? Do you find yourself using your vast you know encyclopedic knowledge of all things weird ass pop culture in some way in your business application, or does it have to matter? Um, I I get two answers to that. It actually helps me because two reasons. Or the work actually helps my brain because it actually helps me focus. And but then every once in a while, when I'm pulling a parallel that it needs to um, that needs to like be brought forth, I can give a cultural, I can give a, a you know economic, I can give a political reference and something from days of yore um, that actually kind of brings that back to life because everything new is old and everything old is new again, and it's those touch points that you can bring back. So. Uh, writing narratives and stories and pitches and um, and missions um, and content. If I can bring a context to it without going down the nerd camp too much, but just cultural wise, because I need, I'm not just connecting to, you know, that 12%, which is now 40%, but to like even larger, I still have to bring those cultural references and being able to bring that forth um, makes those stories actually matter a little bit more because they're put in perspective. And hopefully they actually believe, you know, make the story move a little bit more too. It's really, it, it's a whole other planet. But what I also find, uh, oh, here's a, here's a story that ties into this. Another totally not related segue. Um, this feeling, I had a random experience in an airport with someone who just had a birthday a couple of days ago. And that's the only way I'll out this guy. We're in which he said, Hey, you're into comics, right? This is like five years ago, airport story. And I said, yeah, I am. And he like shows me kind of his Wednesday grabs uh, that he's bringing with him on the plane. And he goes, I don't talk to anybody about this. <laughs> and I was like, well, why? <laughs> it's yeah. it's cool now. Like, yeah. you know, people are people are getting oddly sick of superhero movies, whereas we spent our entire childhood wishing a vaguely decent superhero movie would come around. You know, we had to deal with if, if there were there could be one back in the day. It's not, you know, Richard Corman's uh Fantastic Four version. Nope. It's not that really crappy uh Captain America where he wore a helmet, like a motorcycle helmet. It's not, you know, Spider-Man with his, you know, coffee grounder, you know, his like uh sink drain eyes from the seventies, Nicholas, what's his name? No, Nicholas Hall. Uh, yeah, but you know, you can only it, it, and his only really call of fame outside of that is the, you know the bad reference he had in uh, the Sound of Music. But that's you don't want to do that. He was in Sound oh of Music. Oh my gosh, you go deep. You know how there's like a B side of a forty five. Bob's like the C side or something. There's like another whole piece. <laughs> um, new comics come out on Wednesdays, Steve Garfield. So every comic nerd uh, knows what's going on in Wednesdays because that's when the new stuff hits. So. Um, it's kind of interesting nowadays. It's funny stuff that I, I talked about as far back as trust agents is starting to be done, which is I have a guy in my little town here, Mick. He doesn't sell comics as much anymore. He's a game store that accidentally has some comics, but Mick would on Wednesdays send me photos of my comics, not the comics, my comics. Oh, your poll. Here's yeah. another one. Here's a poll for you. And um, I never subbed to any particular comic. I never subscribed and, and picked up a run. But, you know, when there's a guy like sending you photos on your text or tweeting them to you, you go, oh, I guess I'll go in. And he got so much more money out of my pocket because he'd tweet me photos of my comics. Well, it's interesting. And I'll, I'll bring this element up here. When, you know, COVID-19 happened and retail was decimated and across the board and restaurants were decimated. One of the interesting things was um, there's a place called um, House, um, the Hall of Comics in Southport, Massachusetts, down off of Route 9. 
amazing. Jake and John are just amazing, great people. Um, but what they did during that particular time, how everyone kind of pivoted, they went, oh, here's your pull file. We're actually going to send you pictures of these right now. We can, we will mail these to you because you're spending over $20. We'll do that at our cost. Would you like to keep this run going? It will be helpful for us, but we, more importantly, we believe in the community. What can we do for you? Right. Um, and it wasn't until the uh, DC shipping stopped actually publishing because they just couldn't, that supply chain was diminished. But I looked at them as being, we're just not a retail store. We're a community connection. And then they did ongoing things, other things to keep those, uh, those because it wasn't about the product. And this is one thing I'm, I'm always telling my, you know, my, my clients, it's about the community you're building with your product. And if, if you don't, you need to tap into that as much as possible. It's totally the thing. And I've seen, so I follow a few different comic writers, um, Scott Snyder, Greg Pak, uh, interviewed some of those guys for things. And what they're also doing in this time frame is they're dumping in, um, uh, they're kind of making bum rushes of small indie stores who are having trouble because of this all being shut down and also giving some people some ideas for some cool back catalog pulls while they're dealing with COVID, you know, because it's a perfect time to go into the, the bins, which helps everybody. You know, it helps the store get rid of some of their inventory that they haven't been able to shed. And it helps, you know, new readers or, or, or dads like you, you know, get their kid into it. Although if it's anything like mine, um, my uh, oldest is 18, hated every single thing I'm into but then really slowly com comes back and starts to get into it a lot after the fact. Yeah, they sometimes they resent the, the buttons we installed on them. So until they you know find how they, oh, maybe that I'm a little wired like this too. Utterly so. Let's end it here. I think it's a good time. I think we've hit all the buttons. I think we've hit all the notes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I but, can't believe we kept this many people entertained for this long. It was purely by force of Robert Collins' will and his good looks. Um, you can follow him on Robert Collins on the Twitter. And I asked him, where's your website? And he goes, I am a man behind the scenes. I do all the hard work for all these people. I don't have my own website. I have their websites. So that's the thing. Find Robert wherever you want to find him. Thank you so much for coming on and being part of this. And I'm glad we kept this going from your birthday where I send you something unique and interesting that you didn't recognize, you know, that to bring it back from the touch bone because that also gave me the spirit during this time to kind of go, I got to give something to Chris this morning because it makes me happy to share that with somebody I know who will respect it. I get a daily delivery from uh, Robert and every <laughs> single day there is something that just really fills me up. How old are your kids? Or no, I guess Carol's asking Carrie how old are Carrie's kids? I don't know. teenager -y. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. I'm hitting the end. You guys can comment all you want, but we're leaving. See ya. Bye. Merry Christmas. Ciao. Merry Christmas.